What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. I'm Bob Wankel with Anthony Sanfilippo, and we are finally able to talk about some Phillies baseball, and not just the idea of Phillies baseball, but react to stuff that we saw on the field this weekend over three games in two days down in Florida. I did not watch yesterday's game, Anthony. I, I got to be honest with the viewers. Now, I went back. I, I got well-versed on it, but I spent most of my day upstairs putting together uh, my, my baby's dresser. And so I, I listened to Fransky and, and did the whole radio thing, didn't see the game. Now, you, I don't believe, watched the game yesterday for a different reason. And I'm told, sources tell me, that you got engaged yesterday. So before we jump into the Phillies, I just want to say congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yeah, that would be – that would be. I did watch the entire game on Saturday, including the later innings with all the minor league players. Uh, but yesterday, I, I might have been a little preoccupied. Yeah, yeah but uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the for the kind words. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, you're obviously feeling good about things over where you're at. I think yeah. the Phillies fans right now are probably feeling pretty good about things based on on what they watched this weekend. And so, you know, let's just jump right into it. There's a lot to talk about here, but I think we have to start with what we saw over the weekend. And ironically, you know, everyone's excited on Saturday. They get to sit down and watch the Phillies for the first time. And I watched them and I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see a lot of, I call them like Twitter scouts, you know, guys that, that like kind of like want to tell you, like, I just watched one thing happen on February 25th in one inning. And therefore we can make these, you know, absolute certain judgments and, and deductions about where a guy's at. And I kind of think that that's nonsense. So I tweeted out like, Hey, listen, I'm excited. Everyone should be excited. But let's pump the brakes here. It's one game, maybe even half a game on February 25th. Maybe let's just take everything with like a grain of salt. That being said, we're basically going to start this show by reacting to what we saw. And can you take away anything from what you saw? Or, or am I right? Is Cranky Bob Wankel, who said this is all nonsense, it doesn't mean anything, is he right? Cr Cranky Bob's mostly right. Um, but there are some little things, right? There are some little I mean, look, we know what this team's going to be this year. We know almost every player who's going to be on the roster. There's like one, maybe two spots that are kind of, you know, still up for grabs, maybe three. I mean, but we kind of even even the third one, which is the number five starter, we kind of know what the what the overall plan is. It's just a matter of timing on it. Right. So, it, you know, the, there's not a lot that we're going to get from watching these games and sit there and go, "Ooh, this is really eye opening or "Ooh, this is really going to be what we were was unexpected. But there are little things, right? You find certain players that, you know, like maybe you had never seen play before that you've heard the name or, you know, that you've heard some discussion about and go, all of a sudden you watch them have a, you know, a really good at bat or two or really dominant inning on the mound and be like, oh, okay. And I think that there were a couple of those guys that, that showed up over the weekend. Yeah, I think that the guy on Saturday that really sort of jumped off the page was, was Andrew Baker, 22 years mm -hmm. old. Uh, played across two levels last year, Jersey Shore and Redding. He really opened eyes late in the season at Redding. Uh, just over 10 innings pitched, 11 strikeouts. Opponents hit 094 against him. I mean, he was he was really impressive, especially late in the year. And you saw on Saturday what what he is capable of. And he entered last season as a top 30 prospect in the system. I believe it was 28th on pipeline. I think they're about to reshuffle the organizational rankings uh, in the minor leagues here coming up in the next week or two. And the expectation, I believe, is that he'll probably slot in somewhere uh, around 15, uh, give or take a slot or two. And you saw the upside of what he brings to the table. And there was no way that you could come away from that game and not say, oh, they, they have something here. Maybe they do have something here. So as much as it's about 2023 and can you help me now, is, is Baker a guy that's going to be on this team opening day? No. Could he help later in the season? Well, maybe if he's going to throw 98 and then have a wipeout slider as he did the other day. Yeah, there, there might be something to that. Now, the whole caveat with him is command. He walked about four and a half per nine last year, struggled with his command at times, too many free passes. But if he can take that next step forward, they'll least have a really intriguing prospect on their hands there. Yeah, absolutely. And Bob, like, you know, last season, I think he touched what, 102? Mm -hmm. uh, he got that, that high on the fastball. So that it is, it is elite speed that comes out that he, that comes out. And, and it's not a, it's kind of a slightly funky delivery too. Like when you watch him throw the ball, it's not, as as clean it's a little jerky 
right? But it, but that's okay. I mean, it's it, it, he really brings it hard. Yeah, the slider was way was on on Saturday. I mean, he was dominant against three hitters. It was two strikeouts and a pop up. I think it was. Um, it really really looked good. Now, obviously, you're not going to have that great command every uh, on every outing. But yes, four and a half walks per nine is high. But if you could just pull that down by like a walk and a half, right? Get it down to three. Three is not great, but it's effect. It could be effectively wild, right? You could be a pitcher who throws a lot of balls, but because guys are so worried about getting around on 102, they may end up chasing that slider that's out of the zone or something, right? So, yeah, I mean, if you just get it down a little bit, you could certainly become an effective piece for that bullpen, and you know you're going to need arms to get called up later in the year at some point. Maybe he could be one of them. Yeah, and I think that where I'm at when I watch these games, I can't make a definitive conclusion about what a player is going to be long term. I can't make a definitive conclusion about what his season is going to be based on one inning or two at bats. But what you can do this time of year is open eyes and you can say there is something to work with here. Now, whether or not it materializes down the road. That's a different story, but what, what he was able to do on Saturday and what a couple guys were able to do on Saturday especially was sort of open eyes where you say, okay, I'm going to you know sort of table this for now, but keep this in my back pocket. This is something to monitor as the spring progresses. And with him specifically, I do think it's, a, it's about consistency. If he can string together multiple appearances where you see that command really start to take shape, then you say this might be a guy that we see at some point down the line this season. And really that's what it's all about. Like I know that lo- some people love looking at prospects more than they, they care about what's happening in the here and now at the major league level, uh, especially when the team isn't that good. The Phillies really don't fit that profile though. So it's, it's really all about 23. It's really all about what can this team do right now? What can we be excited about a month from now? And there were things to be excited about a month from now as well. And I thought it was on full display yesterday with Trey Turner. You know, you go out, he's the guy, everyone's going to be looking at what he does. You know, what does he do to this lineup? How does he he make it more versatile? And and you saw it almost immediately yesterday uh, with a pair of hits, a stolen base, scored a run. I mean, it was, it was all there. Any any initial takeaways from Trey Turner that, that just I guess it's what we already knew, but it was nice to see no less. I'll tell you what, the, the bigger takeaway for me, and obviously, you know, his approach at the plate is is top notch. I mean, he's a one of the best players in the game. But afterwards, when they were talking to him about running and stealing bases, and he just got how excited he got about the new rules and the ability to kind of just kind of other take than off. the double oven mitts. He wasn't, yeah, he doesn't like the, he doesn't like the mitts. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't like the double oven mitts and if they're they're forcing him to wear them. Yeah. It sounds um, like, listen, they just gave me $300 million. I guess I'll wear the damn mitts, but I'm not yeah, happy about it. Exactly. Yeah. But no, but he talked about, um, you know, how, how he's going to have the ability to kind of, you know, get, get pitchers a little bit now because they're going to be less, likely to throw over right i mean yes it resets every plate appearance and so you can throw over twice but at the same time like he feels like guys are going to be a little gun shy and so therefore he feels he can get that extra step on a pit on a pitcher headed towards second base he's he's been the best base stealer in baseball for what five years six years something along those lines I just think his numbers are going to go up exponentially this year, Bob. I really do. I'm not saying he's going to be Ricky Henderson by any stretch of the imagination, but instead of stealing 34, I think he could steal 50, 55. And I think, wow. and that's not, that's not an exaggeration. I think that's kind of the, the area he could be. And I, and that's a huge boost for the Phillies. Yeah. I think that when we look at base stealers, we, we sort of oversimplify and just say, Oh, it's all about speed. And I mean, he obviously has elite level speed, but the instinct knowing when to take an extra step, being able to read on the jump. I mean, he's just elite at all of this. I mean, he checks each of these boxes. And I think not only will he steal plenty of bases this year, but I think that, uh, and you saw this a little bit yesterday, he just has the feel. He has a sense for it. He's going to do a lot of it uncontested, I believe, yeah. uh, especially with some of these these rule implementations. So, well, that was, And that was the thing yesterday, but you talk about uncontested. His stolen base yesterday – there's, there wasn't even an attempt to throw him out. He was his jump was so good and timed so well on the pitcher that it was not. There wasn't even a thought to throw down the second base on it. And you know, like how we have this like craving for 
small ball and, and manufacture like as much as everyone wants to see the Phillies come up and have three guys pound 30 plus four guys pound 30 plus home runs this year like we we get excited by that don't you just love the the single the stolen base score on a single like that, there's just something that feels so good about that yeah seeing it almost right away it was beautiful really it was and I, I'll tell you another thing that I uh, gleaned from the game on Saturday and it was especially noticeable with Brandon Marsh, but I felt like it was it was kind of through the lineup. I got the sense that a lot of guys were going up there with this with the actual intent of working on hitting the other way. Now Marsh had two singles on his at bats that went to left field, and it was just kind of you know keep you know the whole routine: keep your hands inside the ball, let it come in a little bit deeper before you take your swing, and go the other way. And he had two nice hits. Uh, one that was a really like a line drive hit the left field and one that was a little bit more of a, you know, a, a bleeder, but it got it got bef- between the third baseman and the shortstop. Th- that's a cool thing to see, too, because y- you worry that guys got so caught up in the, you know, launch angle, turn and jerk and pull. And even though that we're, you know, the shift is is gone now, I still like the fact that guys are thinking that way. And I think that they will be infinitely be better hitters if that is the approach that they take at the plate. You know, what's interesting. And it's part of the reason why I say I don't get too excited about the results early on, especially this early on is for the reason that you just said so many guys come into uh, appearances on the mound or they go to the plate, not necessarily doing what they, they always do or, or not just to trying to find a way on base. It's it's I'm going to work on this part of my game today. So for a pitcher, it might be I really have to, to bear down and work on my my fastball command or I, I really need to get a better feel for something off speed or breaking for hitters. It might be. I'm, I'm not maybe taking the same approach that I might come April April 1st. I'm, I'm just trying to stay back and, and work the opposite side of the field. And so for that reason, I, I think that you're not, you know, sometimes I think you're getting the full sense of what's, what reality might be, but you do see guys that are coming up looking to work on one specific element right now. And, and I do think that that's kind of like a, an interesting disclaimer. And as you said, it's, it's kind of fun if like you're a, a baseball nerd and presumably you are, if you're listening to a Phillies podcast on February 27th, you sit down and watch these games and it's nice to hear it in the background and kind of as you go about your weekend. But if you really dial in, you can kind of look and see sometimes what these guys are trying to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely, Bob. And I, and I think that's important. And I think you're, you're right. I mean, it's, you know, pitchers, it's probably a little bit harder to kind of gauge what their approach is. I mean, Eventually, you can kind of you maybe figure it out like, oh, he's only throwing fastballs or, oh, he's only throwing his off-speed stuff, right? I mean, maybe in that case, um, sometimes they're going to pitch backwards, and, and it might be just because that's the way that they want to try that and see, see if it works. Or, or, or they're trying out a new pitch and you haven't, that they haven't really used before. Um, one other thing I gleaned from the broadcast that I felt was really kind of interesting was they discussed um, when the pitchers have been working on the backfield that – they're ending their bullpens working on pitch outs, which has be- disappeared in baseball over the last few years, right? Nobody pitches out anymore. But the thought process is with the new rules and the and less throwing over to the bag and the notion that teams might be running a bit more, maybe you go back to it just to get your catcher in a better throwing position. And that's I thought that that was a real interesting little nugget. And I said, you know, that's kind of cool. Because that's, again, part of the game, a strategy of the game that had that had gone away, that if it comes back, old school Anthony will be very happy about. Yeah, you know, there's there's so many different things that, that I want to get to, but I, I think it's going to be a theme of, of the spring. And so while this might usually slot more into our one last thing conversation, I think we can just kind of get to it now. You're, you're talking about something on the field strategically needing to be changed, needing to be adapted because of the the rule implementations that we're getting right now. And so now you saw a very small sample size this weekend of the the new Major League Baseball product with the pitch clock. And certainly there was a lot of talk about that. Um, We're seeing, you know, what are teams doing in order to maybe increase the amount that they run? How are they going to uh, handle or limit the run game defensively? I don't know about you, and I, I know where you're at on these issues, or at least I know where you were at uh, a week ago. I, 
in what I saw, and I watched some MLB Network, just kind of like not just the Phillies, but just sort of trying to gauge like what are people saying, how are people talking about it. It, it seems like there is a split down the middle, even with the players, about some of these these rule changes. You know, what I'm kind of gathering is that, that younger players seem to be more okay with it. Older players, more established players, seem to be a little bit more annoyed by it. Um, did you have any like ma- major takeaways this weekend ab- about the rules or maybe one rule in particular that you thought like, wow, here we go. Well, I mean, nothing, nothing like in game that, you know, I, I, like, I didn't notice anything with the, with the shift that really kind of affected much of anything. And, you know, the pitch clock, yeah, there were, you know, games were moving a little bit faster, um, you know, but I will say it, it's funny. Like we kept saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, games are moving fast. Games are moving faster." But it really didn't move faster until the minor leaguers got in, right? On Saturday, because those the first three innings of the of the game on Saturday took an oh, took oh, like what an hour and five minutes or something along those lines. So if you're following that pattern over the course of a nine inning game, you're still looking at three fifteen, right? But once the once the minor leaguers got into the game, it flew and it ended up being two thirty three. Now yesterday's game was 309 right so that's 309 kind of but a 10 8 game that yeah. may have taken 415 for i mean right that yes. that's exaggeration but yeah I, I think what i kind of keep coming back to and i know you and i exchanged the text message over the weekend about well, i was going i was getting to that yes i just kind of feel like i'm i'm more in the like wait and see like i don't need yes. to really condemn or celebrate any of these rules yet um i, I know that that there was the game on saturday that ends that's the one I I get it. I, I would say this, and I know I made the point to you in the text message, like, well, people are talking about it and look at baseball creating some buzz. Like we're actually talking about spring training baseball at the end of February and rules controversy. I kind of equate it to the NFL. Like as much as everyone is sick and tired of NFL officiating, it's a major talking point and a great conversation piece. Now, I'm not watching the, the ESPN talking head shows this week because uh, I never do. I would imagine it will – you know, on the peripheral, like it'll probably make its way into some of these shows at some point. I, I know that you said, see, look, it just ruined a game. It took all of one day. Yep. I, my argument, you know, would be like, don't you think that they'll adapt over the next five weeks? I'm sure that they will. I'm sure that the players will adapt. I'm sure that the league might make some changes too. But what cannot happen is what happened. And the fact that it happened day well day two technically of games because there was games on friday but the fact that it happened so quickly and in case anybody missed it um the end of the atlanta who were they playing was it the i forget who they were playing but the braves red game. sox red sox that's yeah, yeah braves red sox you had a tie game bottom of the ninth bases loaded full count on the batter and the batter was not in f- facing the pitcher with eight seconds left in his at bat. So the umpire called automatic third strike, ended the inning and in the minor leagues, I mean, in uh, spring training, it, it ends the game because obviously they don't play extra innings, but that's a problem because you cannot have that happen in a game that matters. You right. cannot end a game in that situation. And it was really close. Like if you look at the clock, I mean, he, he was in the box. He just didn't lift his head up and, and, be facing the pitcher and he was just a hair off it was like and the umpire was by the book followed the rule called it the right way but that's basically a slap in the face of the fans it's almost like here's what's coming up this is this awesome intense moment in a baseball game and we're going to take it away from you because you know what you got to get out of here faster that's a problem to me bob and so what baseball has to figure out and i'm not certain if they're what the solution is but baseball has to figure out is preventing those kinds of situations from happening yeah because you, I, that's just bad for that's just bad for competition yeah no argument there I, I wholeheartedly agree with you I, I will say having just like i said i watched the game saturday i flipped around I, I wanted to just see what it looked like outside of the phillies like i always feel like sometimes we just or at least i do i just get so narrowly focused on this team because it's what i'm responsible for that i i kind of like i, I think i turn blinders on to the rest of the league sometimes so I just wanted to kind of get a feel. I did a lot of reading over the weekend, like what are coaches, what are players saying about it? And one thing that I just felt personally was 
I didn't miss anything like th- this weekend though. I didn't say like, Oh, this feels so rushed. Um, I, I, I really miss watching a guy get out of the box and scratch his nuts for the third time and wipes blood <laughs> off his brow. Like, I, I never felt like that. I didn't feel like, oh, my God, this isn't my baseball. Like, it, it, I think that one of the things that, that was being talked about, though, was pitchers were almost over-exaggerating the need to go. It was like the yeah. pitchers were so focused on, I have to get the ball and go, that they were actually not even using the time that was being allotted to them. Yeah. So there's going to be an adjustment. We all knew this. You said it, like maybe Major League Baseball tweaks this thing in the next few weeks if they notice like, hey, this part of it's not working. Do we need to create leniency in, in certain regards? Like, I don't know what they're going to do, but I didn't feel like that I was watching a game on, on fast forward either. No, I'll tell you the one thing that I noticed that I think that people will eventually kind of be upset about and has nothing to do with the actual game but more so the experience of watching a game, especially if you're watching it on uh, from at home on TV, is because there's so much, there's so little time now between pitches and so little time between batters and everything. You can't get that quick, re- that good replay in, right? Yeah. I mean, you really like the replay just has to go quick, and it, or else it doesn't happen. And then, like you know, who knows? Maybe three pitches or two batters down the line, you can eventually go back to it. But at that point, it's almost it's not in the moment anymore, right? You want to see it right away. And so I think it's going to impact the broadcasts a little bit. Yeah. And people might be a little bit annoyed by that. I think it's also going to change the way things go pre-pitch between innings. Like you saw that dork Pete Alonzo sprint off the field. Yeah. And, oh God, I hate that guy. He's such a such a dork. Um, well, typical Mets. So he runs into the dugout. Uh, I think it was Vlad Guerrero who talked about it. He's like, I kind of like jogged into the batter's box. Like, it, I, I feel like some of the, the pre-pitch, pre-bat stuff's going to change. Like, Bryce Harper, <laughs> Bryce Harper, I think, might actually have one of the, the biggest adjustments of all. I mean, he is, for as electrifying as it is when he swings the bat, in between pitches, the walk up, the build up. I mean, like, there's a lot there. He's going to have to cut down and adjust on that. And it, it is kind of interesting, too, because he's one of the guys that won't have the benefit of going through this this prolonged spring training period to kind of work on that cadence. You know, he's going to take certainly go down to minor leagues. He'll, he'll deal with it there in his rehab stuff. But he's not going to have five weeks of it either to kind of get used to it right now. So th- that's something I think it's actually kind of worth keeping an eye on as it relates yeah. to the Phillies. I think I think you're 100 percent correct. I mean, look, can can Bryce probably still have one of his like little routines? Because you know, but let's be honest with Bryce. The one thing I can you could say about it is that the routines that he has and like he's had in the past couple of years, they they have changed. Like he doesn't, he's not like you know the Nomar Garcia Park <laughs> kind of guy who feels like he's got to do the same exact seven glove switch thing or whatever you know tight and turn. Uh, unstrapping and strapping the batting gloves, whatever he has his routine, but it's not something that's been his whole life. Right. So it's more about a timing element for him. Like he just wants that, that get into that rhythm. I'm sure Bryce will be able to find something that he can get into a rhythm on between pitches that is within that time frame that is allotted and not be what it was, even if it's not what it was last season and the season before. Right. Uh, one other player that I think that we can just quickly hit on here before we move forward, and we're doing a little bit of a shorter show today. We had some tech difficulties earlier, and now life and, and some other obligations are going to come up here. So probably have another 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, Nick Castellanos, you know, he's obviously one of the major storylines of this entire spring. And frankly, if Trey Turner wasn't here and Andrew Painter wasn't a thing, I think Nick Castellanos would probably be the storyline mm-hmm. of Billy's spring training. And so – you know, the story yesterday, and I don't know uh, which beat writer had it. I think Alex Coffey might have talked to Kevin Long about moving Castellanos up in the box. There's obviously a lot of optimism about his mental space and how he had a hard time adjusting last year. He had a newborn, never felt comfortable, all of those different things. But now from a mechanical standpoint, letting the ball ride a little bit more, Kevin Long, I guess, recently made a suggestion for him to move up on the plate and up on the box a little bit. And you see an opposite field home run. I will tell you this. There have been thousands of adjustments offered to hitters, especially this time of year. And those adjustments will often translate into a positive outcome. And everyone loses their shit and says, wow, this player is now an MVP. All of the problems are fixed. I wouldn't go that far. But in this case, I will say, given that we saw Nick Castellanos fail to homer after mid-August last year, And given that we saw him only hit 
five home runs after the All-Star break last year. The fact that he drove the ball with authority to the opposite field, I, I would say, yeah, that's positive. I am, I guess, encouraged by that. I, how could you not be? Yeah, I was I was intrigued by it a little bit, too. Um, and, and, I, and look, yeah, I, he's going to be so important to this team, especially the first two months of the season. They can't get away with 2022 Nick Castellanos no. while Bryce Harper's out Correct. and expect to hang and, and run in the race with the Mets and the Braves. They just can't. Right. He needs he needs to be a better version of himself, kind of what you know you expected to get or close to what you were expecting to get. Um, because I, I really do believe he's going to be the, the – I think he might be the cleanup guy. Bob in this lineup I'm I've been trying to figure out what they're going to do and I know it's still early and we got a whole nother month before there's a real game but I do think that he might fit best in the lead up in that um cleanup spot um I don't think that they want to keep him down in the order I just don't I think that they feel like he's a run producer when he's at his best and don't you don't want him batting six or seven I think you want him four or five and so I think he's that's where he's going to be and if he's going to be in that spot he needs to be productive he needs to be productive. He needs to drive the ball, not, not just those little, you know, bleeder singles or doink singles, which he was getting a lot of. Yeah, there were there were right? days where you you would watch him last year and he would have a three hit game, or there was I think a four for four game, and three of them were bleeders out to right field, and yeah. and that's not what I want. But maybe that'll get him going. Like maybe that'll get yeah. the confidence going. It just never came. There, you know, right. that other shoe never dropped. Um, it's interesting that you talk about where Nick Castellanos may or may not hit. Uh, yesterday morning, I was uh, running out to Walla to grab coffee, and uh, Rob Thompson was on with Howard Eskin. And Howard gave his lineup to Rob. Like, if I were the manager, this is what I would do. And obviously, it starts with Turner at the top. And Howard mentioned Kyle Schwarber in the two hole. And Rob was very, uh, I, I want to say almost like committal to it. He's like, I totally agree. Like, Trey is going to uh, lead off. And Kyle, we love in the two. So I think we actually know uh, with with no injuries here that you're going to see Turner Schwarber one, two. Then Howard, you know, continued down the lineup. And then you could kind of feel Rob say like, eh, yeah, we'll see about all that. Like, I, I don't know if it's because he already has something in mind or if he's just more like, I need to see what happens over the next four or five weeks. But I think that while we don't know what this lineup looks like quite yet, Turner Schwarber one, two feels like a pretty safe bet. Yeah, I think so, too. And and I, I'll say this, too, Bob. I, I would not be surprised if once Harper gets back, if they flip. Mm. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, and I'm not a huge fan of it, but I wouldn't be surprised just so that they don't ha they can keep Harper in the three hole and have a right hand and have a guy in between who's, you know, keep separate him and Schwarber, keep the lefty separated, right. you know, and have to have a, a left handed pitcher face Turner. Um you know, in the process, if you're bringing a lefty in, but no, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, just getting back to Castellanos that he is in, in my, in my mind going into the season as of right now, the most important player for the Phillies to have early season success. I, I just thought, I think too much hinges on him hitting in order for them to, to be what you need them to be and what they want to be. It's, it's funny, like you go back and look at Nick Cassianos in 2021 and you can turn on highlights and you'll say, there he is hitting a double or there he is hitting a home run. It almost didn't do it justice, though. Like it doesn't do it justice to just go back and look at highlights on a on a nightly or on a daily basis. You watched him hit. And when they signed him, like I talked about this, it was this presence. There was almost like an intimidation factor with him. Like not only was he productive and not only were the extra base hits there, but you felt like that he was like a dog. And I, I mean that in a good way, like fiery and kind of like edgy almost. And it's like the production teamed with the, the presence in the lineup and there was just none of that last year. Like, we can talk about the strikeouts. We can talk about the decline in the numbers. But you just felt like it wasn't even the same person. Right. And I still think it's there. Like, I, I know that I kind of alerted and I, I kind of mentioned some reasons to be a little bit cautious with this. Like, I know there's this idea that he's just going to come back and be that guy again. 
but it's just hard for me to wrap my brain around the idea that that that's all gone. That like 22 is his reality moving forward. Right. So I don't know that he ever gets back to that peak, Nick Castellanos. But can he be a really good middle of the order guy? Like I still, I, I think I have to bet on that. And yeah. I just hope that you know that we get back to that where it's not just like oh, I had a nice game and then we don't hear from him for four days. But like just that like he gets that hit and he's standing on second base and he's, he's looking into the dugout and he's like, you know, that let's fucking go guy. Yeah. We didn't see that last year. No, I agree. I agree a thousand percent. Like one of the things that we really liked about him in spring training last year was, yeah, it was that it was the attitude that he had. Right. It was like, you know, I, I I'm, I'm, you know, he, I'm paid to hit baseball. What did he say? What was his quote? Uh, about the college education. Oh like, yeah. 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 Baseballs, yeah, I, I yeah, the college, college. yeah, I, I didn't go to college. I just hit baseball, so whatever. That's what it was. Um, so like, like we wanted that, like we we liked that, like because that's the kind of thing we wanted. Um, you know, that kind of attitude that you want from your from in your lineup, and it, that just never really materialized. But that's what that's the Nick Castellanos that you want, and if you get that, or even some semblance of that. That's a huge bonus for the Phillies. Yeah, I think that's where my projections and my expectations of this team begin to alter. Like, so, because right now I just assume a bounce back, nothing crazy. And so then when I start to figure out, like, where do the Phillies fall within the division, especially with Bryce Harper probably out until mid June, like, where is the ceiling for this team through the, the first half of the season? But if he becomes that guy, things start to change a little bit. Did you hear Dombrowski, by the way, talking about this? I, I, thought was, I thought it was fascinating. He did an interview and he was talking about uh, projections and he talks about projection analytics, right? And it's something that he's looked at for years that he said, you know, for many years he's looked at it and he feels, and he feels like projections sometimes leave out or don't account for players to have bounce back seasons players to develop it's all based off of last season or the last few seasons right and that's what the that's how the math is being used but it doesn't equate account for those other things and he said look he said we were um we, we were an 87 win team last year with castellanos not having a good year he says we have three young players in a lineup all of whom we expect to be better this year than they were last year and that he means bohm stott and marsh um you add Trey Turner, right, to a lineup that's, you know, he said, look, Major League Baseball says we have the eighth be- uh, MLB.com says we have the eighth best lineup in baseball, but when you bring Harper back, it could be first. He said, when you talk about all those things, plus the pitching and the revamped bullpen, he said, how you can project us to only have one or two more wins than we had last season, considering what we missed last year, doesn't make sense to him. So like he like this is the general manager talking about the same stuff we're talking about, like, you know, projections for his team. Um, And so I find that really kind of fascinating. And it's almost like they're confident, man. Like they they're like, yeah, the hell with this 88, 89. No, we're going for a lot more than that. And I know that's a good thing. It feels like an organization with with confidence and like um, justifiably. So it's it's an organization that that's coming off of a great year that is is spending the money that I just look at this team and I feel like there's adults running it, you know, yeah. for, for the first time in a very long time. Like when they, yeah. when they brought Dave Dombrowski here, it was supposed to be this way. Yeah. And to see it kind of come together, I think a year sooner than, than most of us would have anticipated. It's it's if you're a Phillies fan, like you understand that getting back to the world series is going to be difficult. You understand that winning the NL East is is going to be an uphill battle, but you feel like that this thing is what you thought it was back in you know 2010, 2011. Like when the Phillies did that deal with Comcast, I thought they are going to be a team that's always in it year after year. They're going to be the Yankees in a way. They'll mm-hmm. spend, maybe they don't win the World Series, maybe they don't win the division, but they're going to be in the playoffs every single year. They're always going to be in the mix. And then they weren't for a decade. And it, it, it's starting to kind of come together again where you feel like they're really starting to build something here that while no doubt the window is now with this core group of veterans, you feel like that there might be a next wave coming. Like it just feels more together, more in sync here. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And and the best part, the, the reason that I think it's most um, that you're, you're, you're spot on 
Yes, Dombrowski was in Boston, and they did spend money in Boston, but they didn't. They spent money to win in the here and now. They didn't spend money to win in the future. And it's funny when you look at, you know, Boston has gotten rid of so many big contracts, right? I mean, you know, the Mookie Betts trade, for example, and not signing Bogarts, right? They they are they have been averse to to spending money. Um, in and around the Dombrowski era, it was more about win one year and then let's kind of tear it down and save some money and then get better down the road. So uh, with the exception of spending the money the one year that he won in Boston, Dombrowski's never been in a city or with a team that is willing to put to spend the money that this Phillies team is willing to spend. And so what that allows him to take that slightly different approach where he can win in the here and now, but also consider the future and have that next wave ready to come. Right. I mean, so it's, it's a little bit different. Everybody was always criticizing Dombrowski's being a guy who would trade away all his assets to win in the here and now, but when you have an ownership group, that's willing to spend the kind of money that this ownership group group's willing to spend, you don't necessarily have to trade away those assets because you can, you can lock up players that are good players for a long, long time and make players happy and content and want to, and want to be here. And then rebuild that, you know, lower the lower levels so that you had that sustained success. I think this is a unique situation for Dombrowski, and he's showing us why he's very likely a hall, eventually a Hall of Fame executive. Absolutely. Uh, one last thing that I want to talk about, and I don't know if you have anything else, and, and I'm looking Wait. forward to the – we got through an entire podcast without really talking about Andrew Painter, who will take yeah. the mound, I believe, on Wednesday, which Wednesday. is great. So yeah. we can get back to that Friday, resume normally uh, scheduled programming. <laughs> um Listen, so Manny Machado, we talked about Manny Machado and free agency and, you know, hey, like, why is he even talking about this? And it's a bad look. And, well, now we know why he was talking about it, because there was probably some sense that something was going to get done. And it did. And here we are, 11 more years beyond this one for $350 million. And when you take in the four years retroactively, plus this season all in, I believe you're looking at roughly 16 years for four hundred and eighty-two million dollars, how you feeling about that Bryce Harper contract now? Well, not only that, I mean, I, the the money that the Padres are spending, and they haven't even signed Soto yet, Soto. is mind-boggling. I think I, between Bogarts, Machado, um, you Darvish, uh, Musgrove, and Snell, I believe are the contract. I might have missed somebody in there. Um, but anyway, I, they're over a billion dollars spent between like six guys, five, six guys. It's just, it's crazy money. And it's, it's probably more than, you know, more than those guys ultimately really, really deserve. But if you're, if you look at those contracts and the way they're structured, I can't see the Padres having that sustained success. Like I look at a guy like Soto and I think to myself, there's no way like he's going to, he's going to end up somewhere else. I don't see it. see him staying there. Meanwhile, you look at the contracts, the Phillies are signing and how they're giving these guys a lot of money, but figuring out a way to keep the annual revenue cost a little bit more manageable. I think what's what's happening here is so much better. It's such a better approach. I I don't know. It's it's uh, weird to say that, right? We we don't usually have this happen in Philadelphia and it's being done right. (laughs) I, I don't know what becomes of either of these players. You know, Bryce Harper's not on the field for the next two and a half months at best. Right. You know, 13, 330 versus 16, 480 plus. Yeah. Like, oh man, like just That's side cool. by side, like I'll take the Harper deal. Yeah. Um, but really, it's not just about that. I, I had two other thoughts uh, almost immediately when, when I saw this news. One, if you're Nolan Arenado, like I, you might love St. Louis, but holy yeah. crap. You know, yeah. like, I just, I don't know how you, how you feel good about what just played out. Like, I just feel like you did your extension and then you look and see what Manny Machado just got. And maybe your priority is winning and loyalty to a market, but man, I feel like that there might've been a little bit of a misread on, on what things were going to look like there. I would think he would want that one back. Yeah. I, but I also, I'll give you the, my other thought on it. I think Machado played the Padres. I think yeah. he, he scared them into thinking that he was going to leave at the end of this season. And they were probably like, oh, shit. Yeah. I mean, we got to give him what he wants. There's like almost two simultaneous reads on the Padres. You you kind of commend them for spending the money they're spending. But then you kind of almost look at it and say, like, 
while that's awesome, is this good? Is it not even good business? It's not about that. It's just about like, is it just reckless almost? Like, well, it is, is because they're in place, or is it just like an open vault? And we're like, you know, hey, we're the Padres, is what we do. It's our brand. It's, it, it is reckless. I'll tell you why it's reckless because what's the weakness for me? What, what weakness remains for, for San Diego? Their, uh, starting, I don't know. their starting rotation is the just rotation, okay. The back end, yeah, okay. Sorry, we were a little it's, off there. Like the back end of the rotation is yeah. – Right. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like, look, Darvish is a really good pitcher. Musgrove's a good pitcher. Snell's a good pitcher. But I don't necessarily know. Are they long-term answers in that rotation? I don't oh. think they are, and I think you're going to have – you've traded away all of your prospect pitchers, like real good ones. So what does that rotation look like th- two, three years from now? So if the like I think the Padres window is much smaller than the Phillies, even with all that money spent because of how they spent it on the position players and not on the not so much on the pitching. Yeah, and then the last thing, and I know this point was kind of made. I saw some people on Twitter say this, and I think it's an obvious one. Um, one massive free agent this upcoming winter is now off the market in a, in a class that already looks like it's a little bit light on on impact offensive talent. Reese Hoskins has a good offensive year here. I know people are like, let's wait out and see how it goes with Reese. Like if he has a good year, maybe we can bring him back. I would tell you, and I think I said this last week, but I can say yeah. it more than ever now. If Reese Hoskins has this like outstanding year. There's no way the Phillies are going to bring him back because he right. is going to get paid. You know, yeah. like just like what we were talking about, the Padres, like, you want to go open vault and pay everyone and just be reckless about it. That's cool. I already laid out the case to why I probably wouldn't do a long-term deal with Reese Hoskins to begin with about positional flexibility, financial flexibility moving forward. I know the Phillies are all in and they like to spend and it's a high payroll. Great. But I think you have to keep some roster flexibility more so than, than financial flexibility. I just don't see a scenario where Reese Hoskins goes out, has a massive year, you know, and, and doesn't get paid. I, and and I just don't know that the Phillies are the team to do that. They're not. They're not. I think you're right, Bob. I do have one last thing. Okay. And I want to end it. I hate to, I always hate ending things with kind of a downer note. <laughs> but baseball, Major League Baseball has created this economic reform committee to, and this is what they say, focus in on how best to depress player salaries. Actually, that's a line from Tony Clark from the Major League Baseball Players Association. Major League Baseball would never say that specifically. But the, the plan for this economic reform committee is really to try and institute a salary cap once the next uh, CBA comes up in 2026. The Players Union is never going to go for it. This is going to be a this is going to be a major thing and we're probably looking at some kind of labor strife yet again in Major League Baseball. And so my question to you is this. If we're getting close, and again, we're looking four years down the road, and I know that's a long way away, but you know, if political commentators can start looking at the next presidential election as soon as the first presidential election happens, then we can look four years down the road in Major League Baseball too. Can you envision a world where the players kind of make the league look bad by futzing around with these new rules that will now probably be in place for going forward for several years and really kind of make the league look like crap if they're not getting what they want. And by that, I mean, let me ask, I'm just going to throw this out there because as someone who's been in a union, who was ahead of, I was ahead of the, uh, uh, our chapter of the writer's union when I worked in the newspaper and I know what kind of crazy discussions we have about, things that we can do while we're working to piss off the employee that won't get you fired. Right. So there are things you can do. Um, Could you see a a situation where maybe, you know, they alternate being a little slow, getting in the box and a ball's being called and a strike's being called or a ball's being called strikes being called so that you're not changing the balance of the game, but really making the game slow down, look bad, because you're not getting, because you know that they're they're coming after your money, and you don't want them to come after your money. Is so what does that look like? It, it's um, August of 2025. It's it's August 13th, 2025, and the players, 
you know, like across the board decide today's the day. Like, yeah. We're going to let them know. Cause you would have to do it at yeah. scale. Like it couldn't just be right. one game. Cause nobody would sure. pick up on it. They'd be like what the hell's going on tonight. Right. Right. Like, you'd have to do it like wide scale. Um, it's an interesting thought. I had not thought about that. I agree though with unions. Uh, I've, I've been previously in a union, uh, a teacher's union, nothing where it was like outwardly disruptive, but you do think about like, okay, where are we at right now? What's being asked of us? Where are we falling short? Is there any way we can kind of get our time back a little bit? You know, maybe mm-hmm. not. Like, where do we get our time back? Where do we kind of like make these like little subtle incremental, you know, make our point without being disruptive or not doing our jobs? Right. You know, unions have been known to do that, I guess. Um, interesting point. I think things are going to have to get real. Na- I mean, and certainly we know that there's a precedent for this. Things are going to have to get very nasty and very obviously like establish it. We're nowhere close. But yeah, as like they ramp back up towards this, like it just feels like you clear a labor hurdle with Major League Baseball and right around the corner, there's the next one. And it's always worse and more difficult and, and more daunting. And we'll see. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny, like, you know, why is it coming up today? And, and then the answer to that is, and this is kind of an interesting thing, too. It t- kind of ties into um, – Something that I don't, I don't remember if we talked about it on the podcast or if we talked about it separately, but the, you know, w- we heard that Bally's is going to go yeah. bankrupt. Yeah. Um, Diamond Sports Group, which um, is is owned by I think uh, Time Warner, um, they have already announced that they want to they want out of the regional sports networks. Um, I ca- I got to imagine that as this starts to snowball, NBC is going to do the same thing. Um, and and uh, you're going to find that the, the Phillies and just like anybody else in, in every sport, not just in baseball, but they're going to be shopping their broadcast rights to streamers. And that's what it's going to be. Like Who's going to be yeah. on Hulu and who's going to be on YouTube? Right. right? And every, everybody's going to be in a different spot. And so now all of a sudden you're looking at less, you know, less money probably than you would have than you probably had originally uh, coming in because every team's going to be on their own. And it's not like this collective television thing that's going to happen. Um, and y- you wonder if, you know, the league looks at that and says, well, yeah, the way we can, we can control spending by putting a salary cap in and the players are going to be like, hell no, we're never going to accept a salary cap. And that's why, you know, you're, you're four years out and you have the head of the union already talking about, we're not going to stand for a salary cap. And that right. this, with the, this committee that they're putting together, that's what they're, that's the sole purpose of this committee. Why are they, why are they being so negative about it four years out? I, that's why they see it coming because you they have to control the message. Like this is always a, yeah. a battle in the court of public opinion. And right. so baseball is going to present their, and, and listen, you say, well, how can anybody sympathize with the billionaires? How can anybody sympathize with the teams? Just go back a year ago. We saw this. People were saying the players are being greedy. You're getting paid millions of dollars. Figure it out. I mean, not everybody, but there was definitely like a, a side of a fan that sort of, gravitated towards the major league baseball side of things saying like, Hey, players get it done. And so you're the players, you know, this is a massive issue. This is like world war three. You have to start now kind of saying, this is the expectation. This is what they want to do. This is why we're not going to let them do it because you need people to understand crystal clear. We're not going for this. And this is why. Yeah. So so get used to it now. Yeah, and it's interesting because you know Pittsburgh Post Gazette they were, did an interview with the Pirates owner, uh, Bob Nutting, and Pirates are you know historically one of the teams that does not spend money, right. um, and and he was quoted uh, recently as saying, "We've got to see fundamental change in the economic structure of the game. I believe that we're positioned to do it, not this year or next year, but over the longer term cycle." That is them. That is an owner telling you right now that their plan is to once this CBA is up, have a salary cap. I think that you're looking at uh, uh, another baseball labor war, unfortunately, and not too far off. Uh, so, yeah, enjoy the next three years, fans, because then it's going to get really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> baseball's back. We're excited, ready to go. 
Oh, man. All right. Well, we will be back on Friday to react to everything that goes down this week. Maybe we'll get an Aaron Nola extension. Maybe we'll get Andrew Painter throwing 102 miles an hour in a, an immaculate inning. Uh, maybe there will be plenty of more things to talk about. Nick Castellanos with three more home runs this week. We'll see. Uh, but we will be back on Friday morning to break it all down. Uh, for Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm Bob Wankel. Thank you for listening to Crossed Up. Be sure to follow us on YouTube through the Crossing Broad channel. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts.